Hi everyone, the webinar will begin in just a few moments. Hello everyone and welcome to today's research roundtable on epilepsy and memory. This has been without doubt our most frequently, frequently requested webinar topic and something that our webinar panelists often get asked about in the Q&A sections. We've got a brilliant lineup of speakers today. We're firstly going to hear from Epilepsy Research UK supporter, Faustine, who lives with epilepsy, followed by researchers and clinicians, Professor Arjun Sen and Professor Amanda Wood, who both work in this area. All of today's speakers have contributed to our research blog this month. So if you're interested in hearing more, we'll be sharing the link to the research blog in the chat later on in the webinar. So firstly, earlier this week, we caught up with Faustine. Faustine is a university student and Epilepsy Research UK supporter, and her seizures began when she was 15 years old. Hi, Faustine, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Um, so first of all, how did you find out you, you had epilepsy? So I started having seizures when I was around 15, so I was in year 10. Um, at first, I just thought I was really clumsy because naturally I was quite a clumsy person anyway. But it was kind of when I started having shock like feelings in both of my arms and my upper body um, and was dropping things quite frequently that I thought something wasn't quite right. Um, and then a couple of months after I had my first tonic clonic seizure at school. And that's when we realized that something was definitely not right and I went to hospital. Wow, that must have been um, quite quite frustrating to be um, thinking you were dropping things and not not knowing why, and then and then so so frightening to have that tonic clonic seizure. Yeah, definitely. I'd never really had any health issues before, apart from kind of your usual as asthma, eczema. Um, so to have such a big seizure in such a like big place as well at school, I think in your formative years. You kind of want to look cool in front of your friends and um, it was just very unexpected yeah. And you spoke in your in your research blog for us about about your memory loss as well and so I wonder I wondered if you wanted to speak about that a bit now. Yeah sure um, so I've always suffered with my memory ever since I started having the bigger seizures um, but I think it really hit me when I got to uni this year um, so I have kind of supervisions where we discuss a topic and I was noticing that I was, I was understanding kind of the content, but I was searching for my words a lot more than my peers, which was quite frustrating um, because you kind of want to be able to participate at the same speed, at the same level. And I felt kind of left out, I guess, in a way, which, yeah, it was, it was quite tricky. It was quite hard. And so at, at school and university, um, it, it must have just been so challenging um, dealing with the diagnosis and, and, and of course, the, the side effects that you've spoken about. How, how did being diagnosed with epilepsy impact your, your time at school? So, like I said, so I started having them in about year 10, which is when you're starting to prepare for your GCSEs. Um, so the timing was just really, really hard. I kind of, I was used to being pretty academic um, and being in kind of the upper sets for most of my subjects. And when my seizures kind of got at their worst, at their peak, I, I kind of was moved down to different sets. So I think just that feeling of not fitting in and just realizing that my work was declining was really, really hard. Even though everyone around me was saying, look, it's not your fault, you're poorly kind of just come to terms with it, accept it. It's, it's really hard when you're a teenager. But now I've gotten older, I'm kind of accepting my diagnosis some more and just realizing that, okay, it's, it's not my fault. Mm -hmm. And being a teenager is so difficult anyway without the added pressures of, of dealing with a new diagnosis and, and coming to terms with, with the, the ways it impacts upon you as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and even just kind of things like wanting to hang out with my friends or going to parties, 
I've got to be a lot more aware and a lot more careful in terms of things like lighting um, and just be a bit more vigilant, which again, sometimes did make me feel left out. But again, with age, you kind of get used to it and you make accommodations. Mm -hmm. And having those strategies in place to, to help you do things like meeting up with your friends and, and coming up to exams as you're, you're coming up to now as well, I'm sure. Yeah, so exam season is um, fast approaching and that does mean some sleepless nights, but I try and stay on top of that and have a good sleep routine where I can because I noticed that lack of sleep is a big trigger for me really? um, in terms of having seizures, but also making my memory a bit worse. I guess being tired and then having like medication side effects and just all of that together is, is difficult to manage. That's so interesting because uh, one of the our researchers on on this month's blog, Professor Arjun Sen, and who will be speaking later on in the webinar. Um, in, in his blog, he spoke about the links between epilepsy, sleep, and memory, and, and the, the correlations between those. So that's, it's really interesting that, that you've brought that up as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad. Um, I'm looking forward to reading his blog. I think that's kind of my hope for research in the future as well. Um, it's made me feel less alone. I think participating in this blog and in this um, webinar has made me realise that I'm not on my own and there's probably hundreds of people kind of in the same boat as me. Um, so it, it was helpful in that way. That's so lovely to hear. And one, one question that we ask members of our SHAPE Epilepsy Research Network is what one thing would be life changing for you in terms of your epilepsy? That's a really good question. Um, I think there's lots of things, but if I had to pinpoint one, I would probably say maybe looking into kind of short term memory or memory loss um, in students with epilepsy, because I think it's important to look at it in any age group. But the dynamic is quite different when you're a student because you've got to kind of retain so much information and study and do exams. So I think that would be an important part of research for me. Brilliant. And of course, we'll also be hearing from Professor Amanda Wood, who's looking at epilepsy and memory in children too. So during those those formative years as well, which will be really interesting. And then the, the final question that we ask all webinar participants is what are your hopes for future research into epilepsy? Um, again, I think my, like memory related things. So just why the link between memory and epilepsy or why do kind of anticonvulsant medications sometimes affect your memory or feel like they affect your memory? I know for me, I get kind of brain fog um, before a seizure and after a seizure too. So I just like to know a little bit more about that so I can understand my brain and my body better. That's so, um, so brilliant to hear. And I know so many people watching the webinar will, will resonate with, with that, that there's so much more research needed into the, mech the underlying mechanisms of memory and how, how medications play with that, with those mechanisms as well. And it's something that is, is such a fascinating topic and where more research is desperately needed. Yeah, absolutely, definitely. Well, Faustine, thank you so much for joining us and taking the time to speak with us today. And of course, for contributing to our research blog that people will be able to read through the links at the end of this webinar. And best of luck with your exams as well from all of us. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Faustine, for joining us to discuss your experiences of epilepsy and memory. And again, if anyone watching wants to hear more about Faustine's experiences, experiences her research blog will be shared in the chat um, at the end of the webinar. So now I'm going to hand over to Professor Arjun Sen, who is a consultant neurologist at the John Radcliffe Hospital and BRC Senior Research Fellow at the University of Oxford. And Arjun has previously been awarded funding by Epilepsy Research UK to investigate autoimmune epilepsy, but today he's here to discuss epilepsy and memory in the clinic. Um, thanks very much, Kiva, and thank you to Epilepsy Research UK for asking me to speak on this most important topic. 
So hopefully you can see this screen there. So we're going to talk about epilepsy and memory. And I'd say at the start that it's important we remember that epilepsy is the archetypal disorder of cortical networks. So this is a paper from some time ago, just showing that if seizures start in one part of the brain, then many other parts of the brain can be activated and involved as well. And that will be important as we go through this brief presentation. This is perhaps demonstrating cortical networks in a more dynamic way. So hopefully this is all of you, all of us, um, with the cogs whirring appropriately and the information being registered, and then they're able to recall that information appropriately. And what happens in seizures is the cogs slightly misalign. So this is perhaps a demonstration of a focal seizure. And so the cogs don't quite match up. And you can see how that might lead to abnormal cortical discharges, which can lead to the seizures, but that may also contribute somewhat to memory impairment. And remembering that this is a disorder of cortical networks, it may not just be one cog that misaligns. There may be other cogs that aren't quite operating correctly, again, contributing to the impairments that we may see. So the causes of memory impairment within people who have epilepsy can be quite diverse. And this was summarized and broken down in a paper now just over 10 years ago, where you can look at the nature of the underlying pathology, what actually underlies the seizures, whether that's on the right side of the brain or the left side of the brain, whether the age at seizure onset and the impact that that may have had on education may also contribute to memory uh, and memory difficulties in the clinic in later life. Then there are variable factors, such as medications. We're not going to talk about medications too much within this presentation. And whereas it's definitely the case that certain anti-seizure medications in some people can have an adverse impact on memory, there are other things that can contribute also, but it's something to definitely bear in mind. Whether there are subclinical seizures, whether that's contributing, whether you actually have full control of the epilepsy and whether that could be improved. It's also fundamentally important to remember about comorbidities in epilepsy. So memory difficulties are certainly a comorbidity, but likewise mood can be a very significant comorbidity in people who have seizures. And if that can be improved, then so too can memory and potentially seizure control as well. We heard from Faustine earlier how sleep and, and the quality of sleep can impact upon her memory. So again, that's something easier said than done, but at least something that we can look to try and improve, to try and again improve both seizure control and memory. Then there's the condition itself. So status epilepticus and bouts of status epilepticus can certainly impair memory, and we should do all we can to try and control those. Likewise, repeated generalized seizures or seizures that result in head injury can again set up different cogs that might not quite work correctly, again, contributing to memory impairment. And something that's been looked at more and more is the contribution of dementia, so Alzheimer's disease, for example, to memory, and whether there are bidirectional relationships between seizures and other conditions. And so looking at that a bit more closely, well, we said at the start that epilepsy is the archetypal disorder of cortical networks. Well, neurodegenerative disorders can also target neuronal networks, so they don't necessarily affect just one part of the brain. And this is, again, graphically illustrated in this functional magnetic resonance imaging study. And might these conditions then coexist slightly more closely than we thought? Well, seizures are very common in people who have Alzheimer's disease. So one in nine people with Alzheimer's disease will have a seizure. And Alzheimer's disease itself is obviously a very common condition. And as populations age, it is only going to become more and more common. So if we start to put those things together a little bit, well, we know from work that's been done several years ago now, um, and this is work in, in high income settings, that the incidence of epilepsy does increase with age. And there's an inflection point at about the age of 55. And in later life, the incidence of epilepsy is at its highest, much higher than it is in early life. We know that Alzheimer's disease is more common in later life, but if we look at Alzheimer's disease specifically and the risk of seizures, well, if you have Alzheimer's disease and you're 80, then you're three times more likely to have seizures than someone who does not have Alzheimer's disease and is 80. 
But if you, you're in your 50s, remember the inflection point for seizures was at about 55. If you're in your 50s and you have Alzheimer's disease, so more, most likely a familial Alzheimer's disease, then you're nearly 90 times more likely, nearly 90 times more likely to have seizures than someone who is 50 who does not have Alzheimer's disease. And this and lots of other work um, that has been looked at suggests that there is a close intersection between epilepsy and Alzheimer's disease. And the incidence of epilepsy and Alzheimer's disease is likely very underestimated because people don't recognize the events as seizures. People with Alzheimer's disease might be less able to report the seizures, often an EEG is not performed. And the more progressive the Alzheimer's disease, the more common the seizures are. Slightly prophetically, Epilepsy Research UK, prior to new logos and branding, recognized this in 2013, but they said that 10 to 22% of people with Alzheimer's disease may develop unprovoked seizures at some point. That led us, on a slightly separate topic, to think, well, actually, if seizures are really common in people with Alzheimer's disease, and if seizures are unrecognized in people with Alzheimer's disease, might it be possible to actually suppress those seizures or suppress subclinical seizure activity, which, as we said, might be contributing to memory impairment? And actually, could that lead to a cognitive improvement in people with Alzheimer's disease who have not necessarily had an overt seizure? This might be a separate webinar, but that led to this clinical trial, um, which we initiated in Oxford to recruit people with Alzheimer's disease who've not had seizures to see whether levotrastam might offer some cognitive benefit rather than it just being used as seizure control. So why am I saying all of this and where and how does this interrelate to people with epilepsy who don't have dementia or any of these other neurodegenerative conditions? Well, there are lots of intersections and there's another intersection with vascular disease. So epilepsy intersects with Alzheimer's disease and Alzheimer's disease pathology. And epilepsy can intersect with vascular disease, so hypercholesterolemia and so on and so forth. And there's an intersection independently between vascular disease and Alzheimer's pathology. And where does that take us? Well, then we can start to look slightly differently through a different lens at late onset epilepsy. So late onset epilepsy, people who develop epilepsy after the age of 55, and there's not an underlying cause, um, or an underlying cause isn't immediately apparent, can be stratified and we can look to try and determine what drives that. And this is an analysis that was done by Michelle Romilly, who's specified here, looking at all of the papers, looking at late onset epilepsy and trying to identify was there a cause found. And in that, you find that the most common cause is stroke, and that happens at about the age of 60. Dementia is quite common, and that happens a bit later, maybe about 67 or so. But all of these other things are also risk factors for late onset epilepsy. So vascular risk factors and exercise can be protective. And why does that matter? Well, that influences our um, trajectories of cognitive decline. And that brings us back to what we were talking about at the start of how seizures and epilepsy might intersect with memory. So this was a theory that was put forward in 2009. This is when I was doing my PhD. I remember when the paper came out that we were very disappointed because it didn't fit at all with what we thought the correct, correct in inverted commas, model of cognitive decline in people of epilepsy was. But what that paper suggested, and it was based from neuropsychometric data done in great detail, and it suggested that, well, we all decline. We all have decline in our memory as we get older. And at some stage, we will cross a threshold for functional impairment. And what happens in people with epilepsy is that there's an initial hit, but then decline is parallel to that slope. So you cross the threshold for functional impairment somewhat earlier, but there's no other additional impact on your memory as you go through the rest of life course. It took us some time, but in the same journal, about nine years later, we published this model, suggesting that that earlier model was perhaps not quite what was experienced, what was the lived experience of people with epilepsy. So we said, OK, people without seizures, all of us, there is a, a rate of decline. There can be an initial hit, and then sometimes the decline might parallel what we see in the normal population. But more often, the trajectories are different and very individualized. 
So you might have an initial hit and you don't get back to that same point, but then there are impacts from further seizures or status epilepticus, for example, or potentially medication. Or you might get back to this point and then you have a second hit. So for example, seizure results in a head injury. And then again, there's a, a modulation in the trajectory of cognitive decline. And how do we then bring all of that together? So our most more recent work has been looking at this kind of model. So this again is people who don't have epilepsy, all of us decline as we uh, with aging, everyone, there is some impairment of memory. People with mild cognitive impairment, which can be a precursor of Alzheimer's disease, generally project on the same trajectory as people who don't have cognitive decline and then begin to diverge in later life. And then if there's Alzheimer's disease, for example, that divergence might become more profound. In people with uh, late onset temporal lobe epilepsy, so there, the set point seems a little bit, just a little bit lower than people who don't have uh, any uh, seizures or cognitive decline. But then when the seizures start, then you notice really quite a divergence from people who have mild cognitive impairment. And importantly, work from others has shown that this set point is lower than people who have just mild cognitive impairment. If you have early onset epilepsy, and we put here temporal lobe epilepsy, then the seizures are starting much earlier, and then you can progress down that complex trajectory that we mentioned, where seizures, medication, potentially status epilepticus, lots of things can impact on memory. So the reason that's important is we can do something about it. And particularly what we can do is something about seizures that are perhaps starting later in life, but a lot of what I'm going to say might apply in earlier life as well. And what we're looking to do is move this curve. Um, so for example, we said that smoking, diabetes, high blood pressure, all of these things can increase your risk of late onset epilepsy. So if we try to control those risk factors earlier in life, particularly in midlife, maybe that will reduce the risk of late onset epilepsy. And we know that very similar um, risk factors contribute to dementia. So potentially you can reduce the risk of epilepsy and reduce the risk of late on, uh, developing dementia in later life. And all of these may contribute to cognitive improvements in people with epilepsy. Similarly, trying to improve sleep hygiene, trying to ensure good sleep, regular sleep, healthy lifestyle, all of these, what may be considered rather more conservative or straightforward measures might actually help in memory and move this curve so that then the threshold for cognitive impairment is crossed later in life. Now we and lots of other people are looking at this very actively to see how this can be appropriately targeted, who it might suit, how it can actually be done. And this I think will prove a very um, fruitful area of research, but fundamentally it will prove a fruitful area to trying to improve the care of people with um, seizures going forwards. So I'll conclude there. And hopefully what we've demonstrated is that epilepsy and memory seem to be inextricably intertwined. I've concentrated a little bit on late onset epilepsy and epilepsy in later life. And that's partly because the impact of epilepsy in later life is going to be fast. And everything that we can do to shift those curves and improve those curves will be better, both in the UK and more globally. And you can see here, this is the prevalence of epilepsy from the Global Burden of Disease Survey, showing just how much um, the burden of epilepsy in later life is going to impact across the world. It's very important to have an individualized anti-seizure medication plan important, and I've not discussed that much, and maybe we'll come to that in the roundtable discussion, about certain medications that might impact on memory, trying to avoid those um, in, in, uh, and improve the treatment profile wherever possible, and taking a comprehensive holistic approach to comorbidities. Shifting the trajectories through simple measures could be transformatory, and we very much hope that's the case. And again, just returning to late onset epilepsy and the reason that's important, even Captain America gets old eventually. Thank you very much. Thank you so, so much, Arjun. What a um, positive note to, to end things on with the, these um, simple measures that, that could be tran transformational and could 
could shift that that curve just on a little bit I thought that was something really really positive and I was so struck by the the overlap between epilepsy and and Alzheimer's and I wonder if you if is there are there things that epilepsy researchers can learn from researchers working in areas such as dementia or or other neurological conditions that that impact memory Thank you, Kiva. Um, that's very kind. And yes, absolutely. I think there is a risk always of becoming quite siloed and that you just look at a specific condition and actually you become more and more niche. So you look at more and more just at a specific aspect of that condition. And certainly what we try to do here in Oxford is be very transparent. And so we collaborate very closely with the Cognitive Disorders Group. And a lot of the work that I'm showing, the trials, for example, are all coming with collaboration with the people who are dementia specialists, both here and not, not even just cognitive neurologists. So dementia is seen a lot by old age psychiatrists, so we collaborate very closely with them as well. And I think that, yes, we can learn a lot certainly from those groups. Hopefully they can also learn a lot from us because as we mentioned, seizures are very under-recognized in people with Alzheimer's disease. And if you're not used to asking an epilepsy history, if you're not used to going through things that might be seizures, then that could be overlooked. And yet potentially it's really treatable because if we say, okay, someone with Alzheimer's disease who may be having additional focal impaired awareness seizures, you control those, for example, amnestic wandering is thought to be uh, likely ictal, and it's likely to have an ictal wow. basis, then you could potentially treat that and actually significantly improve cognitive life. That Wow, that I'd never heard about the, I, I'd thought about you learning from dementia researchers, but of course they have a lot to learn from, from epilepsy, especially with the aging population and one in nine people with Alzheimer's having having seizures as well that that's amazing that the medication could impact upon upon the seizures and then quality of life as well yeah potentially and I think I mean you're you're obviously preaching to the converted but I do think that is really important and I think we can learn a great deal um, from lots of different specialities and for example, the old age, um, the psychogeriatricians can teach us very much how to handle mood in older people with epilepsy, um, which may involve quite a different approach to someone who is much younger. But again, improving improve, improvement of mood, sorry, improvement of mood, coupled with improvement in quality of sleep and so on and so forth, might have a very positive impact both on seizures and on cognitive difficulties that someone might be experiencing. So yes, I think what we'd really hope to achieve is a bi-directional relationship so that both parties are, are learning and then moving things forward to try and improve patient care. And a, a collaborative approach to, yeah. to patient care. Well, thank you so much, Arjun. We'll be speaking to you again during the uh, roundtable discussion section, but thank you so much for, for speaking about, about that work. Thank you so much. So now I'm going to hand over to Professor Amanda Wood, who is at Aston University in Birmingham and Deakin University in Melbourne. And Amanda and colleagues were funded by Epilepsy Research UK in 2015 to investigate memory and pre-surgical planning in children with epilepsy. And Amanda is joining us now live from Melbourne. Thank you so much, Amanda, and over to you. Thank you so much, Quiver, and um, again, like Arjun, thanks to Epilepsy Research UK for inviting me um, to come and speak, so that's brilliant. So yeah, I'm, um, I'm a neuropsychologist by training, so I'm going to um, talk through some of the, the cognitive elements of um, memory concerns that people living with epilepsy often raise with us and um, discuss the research that Epilepsy Research UK supporters um, contributed to and funded um, some years ago. So we often hear in clinic um, and in daily life, um, people saying that my memory is terrible. And we know that in people with epilepsy, there is a high frequency of memory concerns that's reported in everyday life. And as Arjun was mentioning, um, one of the, the goals really is to improve quality of life. And this is a source of some distress um, for many people. 
And when we think about memory, what people often um, are concerned about is a degree of forgetfulness. So forgetting items on a shopping list, something that you've just said to them. Sometimes it's words um, that they can't remember whilst they're speaking. I might do that, I might do it quite often. Um, or even activities in recent hours or days. And so all of those um, memory complaints, if you like, um, reflect um, the experience of being forgetful, but from a cognitive perspective, in fact, reflect a range of very specific domains of function that may or may not be um, memory per se. And so I hope to talk you through what we mean by that. We know from old research that the um, severity of that experience or complaint is not necessarily related to objective measures. So when we assess people um, and look at their memory in detail, um, the bitterness of their complaint doesn't necessarily reflect how bad memory per se is. And what we know from a cognitive perspective is that um, our abilities, um, and if, if we look at memory up here, are actually link into each other. So my memory function relates to my language processing, um, and that rests on my ability to pay attention to things. And as Arjun just nicely outlined um, in the previous presentation, this is also based on the idea that the brain is a cortical network. Um, and so those networks or cogs working together are what gives rise to successful memories and um, when one cog goes wrong one different part of the brain perhaps isn't functioning in the way um, that it typically would then we can experience forgetfulness but the cognitive basis of that might be a language problem a primary memory problem or in, indeed an attentional difficulty and it's really important for us when we're walking we're, when we're working rather with people living with epilepsy that we understand the specific nature because that allows us to provide strategies and hopefully treatments in the future as Arjun was um, outlining earlier. So even within the cognitive domain of memory, there's a degree of complexity. And I, I certainly won't go through this in great detail, but when we think about examining memory um, in clinic, but also when we're using brain mapping techniques, we need to be cognizant of the different components of learning. So we need to take information in, we need to be able to withhold that in the face of new information coming in, and we need to be able to store it over time. So that ability to encode, consolidate, date and retrieve is very um, well established in, in a broad sense in the memory literature and that can involve different parts of your brain. So when we think about examining memory um, in a surgical setting, we need to consider which areas we might examine there. So the, um, if epilepsy is the archetypal cortical network disorder, this case of HM is the archetypal um, case that actually explains to the international community what happens when we um, surgically treat seizures successfully. But in the very early days of epilepsy surgery, it was unclear what some of the impacts would be. So HM is a case that's taught in cognitive neurology, in psychology, all over the world. And essentially, um, HM um, was in a, a Canadian case and had both hippocampi or bilateral mesial temporal lobes removed. And that did reduce the frequency of his poorly controlled seizures. But an unexpected outcome was that he was no longer able to form most new memories. And he taught us that we need both hippocampi in terms in, in order to remember new information. What's fascinating about this case, however, is if you read some of the stories and literature about him, he was able to improve his piano playing abilities, but he didn't remember playing the piano. So that tells us um, that the hippocampi are not important for procedural learning, but are important for episodic memories. Um, and so um, we've learned a huge amount um, about cortical memory systems from cases like this. But importantly, what that suggested was that there might be an approach in which we only um, intervene surgically in one hemisphere of the brain, as Arjun was saying, the left or right sides make a difference to your memory, but also in terms of epilepsy surgery. And so that's the way in which um, those people with uh, poorly controlled seizures and temporal lobe epilepsy who are eligible for surgery uh, are now managed. So avoiding that um, global amnesia that HM experience by performing a unilateral one-sided temporal epectomy. So there's been a range of research since then, um, which is really heralded by the cautionary note of the case of HM, which is to prevent memory loss after surgery. 
And in recent years, um, internationally, there's been a huge effort to use brain mapping techniques. Arjun again mentioned functional magnetic resonance imaging, and that's one we'll talk about a little bit now. Um, and one of the previous chairs of Epilepsy Research UK Scientific Advisory Committee, Mark Richardson, has published an awful lot of the very early work in adults and showed that in fact, we can successfully use brain mapping techniques such as fMRI um, to identify activation in that left mesial temporal lobe if we're particularly interested in memory for verbal information. And that that is a useful predictor of the status of memory after surgery, which is a very powerful technique for us to be able to use clinically. The work from that group also, however, highlighted that sometimes you can see activation in that right or contralateral um, hippocampus or mesial temporal lobe. Um, and so that um, causes some concern for us in a paediatric context because in children, a normally well lateralized memory task, such as Richardson and colleagues showed in adults, might actually not occur for very clear developmental reasons. So we know from a range of other research um, that children's brain development continues across the course of childhood and there's a refinement of cortical brain structure and concomitant with that is a, a maturation, if you like, of functional skills or cognitive skills and behaviours as well as a range of other functions. Uh, and so with that in mind, um, we feel that it, or felt that it was very important that we understood whether the known structural changes in the brain actually were associated with representation of function um, that was different in children and adults. And so there um, is some data that examines um, what happens uh, to children's cognition after surgery. So um, a, a relatively recent systematic review um, by Flint and colleagues has examined this and looked at a range of different cortical domains. Um, but in the, in the area of memory, what they found was that memory was often reported in those um, existing research studies in about 20% of studies. So not everybody has um, documented memory outcomes. Um, and on the whole, memory functions after surgery in children um, either improve or remain stable, which is a very positive sign, which is why surgery can be considered um, uh, to, to sort of uh, help with seizures. But um, about a quarter of children do exhibit a deterioration of memory. And it's very important for a range of reasons that we try to understand not only why that occurs, but which children might be most at risk. Um, in part so that we can um, support families to make well-informed decisions, but also in order that we provide support and strategies to children as they um, continue their educational journeys. Um, and so there is um, some data also about models of memory. So um, Arjun and I are sort of uh, tapping into similar sorts of uh, concepts. And we know um, that in general, uh, it's important to think about the fact that after surgery, verbal memory does appear to be a bit susceptible, but then continues um, to pick it pick up um, in terms of um, abilities. So the question in children in particular is, are those um, deteriorations uh, permanent um, or can they be modified or do they naturally um, improve over time? And, and that's an area of research that I think is really fascinating given the discussion that Arjun's had in the older population just now. Mm -hmm. So um, that led us to start thinking about trying to um, perform brain mapping of memory prior to surgery in children. And um, if you can imagine being popped down a very small tube um, with a helmet over your head and told not to move for 45 minutes. Most adults don't like that. So there are some specific challenges in children to doing this kind of research, but we came at this with a little bit of experience. And so we were really interested in trying to establish a functional mapping paradigm of memory that was relevant to children and took into account the differences in their cognitive development as opposed to the adult work that had been done before. And we particularly wanted to test the idea um, that children um, who that show less lateralized activity, so it's more like that second paper from Richardson and colleagues where there's left and right sided um, mesial temporal activation um, than adults in a task that is normally very well lateralized to the left in um, adults. So um, we know we wanted to do that because we know that the representation of language 
uh, increases to the left hemisphere of the brain across childhood and we and others internationally have shown that with functional MRI and that has some implications for the way in which we interpret findings in the memory domain. So we were very successful and very lucky um, to receive some pilot grant funding as Quiva mentioned back in 2015 and Professor Stefano Seri and Dr Elaine Foley and myself um, joined in a collaboration. I wasn't an Aston at the time, but that's why I joined in part um, later on. And um, we've recently published um, the initial outcomes of that data. So I'm gonna just very briefly present those results and talk about next steps. So um, this is a bit of a, a busy image on the screen, but um, the, the key issue here is that um, in the lower part of this um, image, we demonstrated successfully that using a developmentally appropriate paradigm for children that took into account their inability to read and the complexities of brain mapping in children, um, we got left-sided mesial temporal activation in adults. And if we look on the second panel um, overall on the right-hand side, what we found was that children did indeed um, have more right-sided activation. And this is a, a group map, so individual children showed varying levels of this. But if we look at the group overall, what we showed is that the asymmetry or the left-sided nature of activation during our mapping paradigm increased over time. And in our view, um, in this cohort of typically developing children who aren't living with epilepsy in adults, it has some implications for the way in which we might use this technique in populations of children being considered for epilepsy surgery. So just a brief summary before we might go on to some questions about that. Um, it's really important uh, that when we think about developing um, non-invasive um, brain mapping techniques for children, that we do so in a developmentally appropriate way. If we provide tasks that children can't perform in a brain scanner, that activation that we do see can't be um, interpreted reliably. Um, and so assuming that adult paradigms will work is, is, is risky business essentially. Um, our ongoing research is going to further explore this. In fact, we've um, almost finished um, the, the work in children living with epilepsy who were undergoing surgery. So very excited that that's an extension from our pilot funding um, in collaboration with Birmingham Children's Hospital Epilepsy Surgery Program. And so trying to validate the initial pilot work in a, in a patient population to show that we can, we can use that and complement all of the other components of that multidisciplinary team workup prior to surgery. Um, and really excitingly, um, the, the work that's been done in Aston, particularly in other areas of brain mapping, um, MEG and paediatric epilepsy, um, led by Professor Sarah and Dr Foley, has really transformed the way in which others around the UK and beyond are now thinking about using advanced technologies in pre-surgical mapping for children. And that's a really exciting thing as a, as a clinical researcher to, to watch um, as a result of some early results in other domains. And really importantly for the general community, um, I think I'd like to end with the idea that if we, if we have concerns about being forgetful and, and we're concerned about our, mem our memory, um, it's, it's helpful to really carefully evaluate the nature of that complaint, if you like, or that concern, as that can definitely help us to guide strategies that people can use. Um, and hopefully, as Arjun's just alluded to, perhaps um, identify more appropriate treatments for those specific cognitive difficulties that people are experiencing so as to better support um, the, the everyday of exper experience of people living with epilepsy. So I'll finish there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amanda. That was so interesting and so brilliant to see that there's still impact being generated from, from that pilot study way back in, in 2015. And obviously you're working as a clinician and I wonder, is memory something that the children that you work with come come to you often about, or perhaps their their parents or carers come to you about? Yeah, Quiver, it's a great question, and it's absolutely one of the cognitive concerns that parents, in particular, identify. Older uh, older adolescents may be aware that they they struggle with forgetfulness, particularly in class, taking in lots of information if teachers are going at a pace. Um, but parents will quite often say, you know, um, they're really forgetful. I have to say things over and over. And it's really important for us to then um, take that really good cognitive history to identify 
is this an attentional difficulty because there are some practical behavioural everyday strategies that we might recommend a light touch on the fold on the shoulder breaking things down into two simple commands instead of I need you to go here and get this and then do that and don't be late um, as opposed to what we might refer to as a primary memory um, impairment um, because that will help guide parents in their everyday life supporting their child as well. Brilliant. Well, at this point, I'd like to bring Arjun back um, back on screen and we'll begin the, the roundtable discussion. But Arjun, I'd like to ask the, the same question I've asked Amanda. You know, you're, you're obviously dealing with patients at a different point um, in, in their lives. And I wonder, is, is memory a frequently asked ask query that that you get asked about when when you're seeing people in the clinic. Hey, thanks, Eva. Um, yes, it definitely is. I think, uh, as you said at the start of the the roundtable discussion, it's probably the symptom that people mention most. Um, and sometimes the cognitive difficulties actually cause greater adverse impact on quality of life than the seizures themselves. Um, and that might seem a bit strange, but the, the seizures are episodic, you know, that they, it happens and then, you know, hopefully the seizure will stop and there will be recovery, but then it is, it is done. Whereas the cognitive difficulties and the memory difficulties might be there all the time. And so that leads to it being very frequently mentioned. And um, we're always looking to try and highlight things that we can do. And as was alluded to, um, cognitive difficulties, memory difficulties in Amanda's talk, it's very multifaceted, you know, it's not one specific thing and actually trying to unpick what the difficulty is and what is it that's causing the impact on the memory, I think is really important to be doing in epilepsy clinics. Of course, and um, that's really interesting that, yeah, of course, seizures are transient, whereas the memory um, memory as a worry could could be there all all the time and um, as as Amanda was saying it in in young children there could also be um, the knock on effect on on learning in school that must be something that is is quite frustrating as as a young child as well. Yeah, no, from my point, absolutely. I think that the impact on education. Um, can be very profound and, uh, and Amanda is probably better placed to comment on it. But I think that uh, talking about epilepsy surgery, if you can get epilepsy surgery early, if you're determined to be an epilepsy surgery candidate early and the operation goes through and you can try and settle the seizures in order to be able to get back into education and really improve life chances, that again is a, is a very good cognitive outcome from an epilepsy surgery programme. And so and that's a really, yeah, that's sorry, a really interesting it. point, um, Arjun, I think, and, and I'm not medically trained. And so, you know, it's outside of my area of um, expertise, but certainly um, that notion of optimising opportunity um, is, is really critical. And, and we know, of course, that there are critical periods in, in brain development. So early is, is often really good. And I think also to add to that, query, you know, it, there's educational um, implications, but also occupationally, I think for, for young adults entering the workforce, force the idea that actually it's very difficult sometimes to to manage the the symptoms of memory difficulties in between um, episodes of seizures or even if there are medication related issues that, that occasionally occur and so it's really important um, that people living with epilepsy are able to communicate with employers about that so that there's not an, a sense that we well, keep forgetting things. Why aren't you doing your job or, or questions like that? So there are some real life um, consequences that I think having a narrative and being very open about the fact that this is a well, um, well known or well established um, experience for people living with epilepsy can really help understanding and improve quality of life um, across the life course. I would echo that completely. I think that, you know, trying to improve understanding of epilepsy more broadly and highlighting that epilepsy does represent more than seizures. And so all of these different comorbidities and trying to enable people um, to fulfil their potential, I think is going to be key. And that's really beholden on employers to try and understand that and then put in place the strategies that will enable people to do 
do their, their work to the best of their potential. Yeah, so you've mentioned you've both mentioned education and employment, and of course, social life and building personal relationships as well. That's another important area that that could also be be impacted. And so I wonder, um, Amanda, you mentioned medication and an origin. You spoke about medication. Um, I wonder if you know, do you think that's an area for, for future research to better understand the, the relationship between epilepsy, memory and, and medication in there as well? Um, sure, I can, I can go first on that perhaps. But yes, so, so oftentimes um, when people come to clinic, they may say that the, 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 there's cognitive impairment and it's attributed to the medication. But as we've illustrated, it's more complex than that. And there may be other causes to the cognitive difficulties or the memory difficulties, such as the underlying seizures themselves, how well they're controlled, what the substrate of those seizures um, is or are, and so on and so forth. There are certain medications that have a, a definite specific cognitive impact. So, for example, um, tapiramate can associate with specific word finding difficulties, Valprate can associate with hyperaminemic encephalopathy, so high levels of ammonia, which can cloud cognition. Now, that not at all, that's not a reason to not use those medications. That's just to be mindful that those things can happen. And so if people mention those sort of specific side effects, like a, a word finding difficulty, having escalated the dose of tapiramate, then it may be attributable to, to tapiramate. One of the things that we're trying to develop is tasks that people can do to test cognition, so pre and post trying a medication, so you can actually objectively see what the change may have been with the medication. And those can be quite difficult because if you do, as Amanda will no doubt allude to better than I, if you do neuropsychological testing too frequently, there can be a lot of practice effect because people get better because they've done the test before. So that's what we're trying to unpick and work out how you could deliver that. I mean, that sounds really exciting. So this is um, <laughs> maybe getting up early in the morning, super, super terrific. Um, but yeah, I think uh, that's a really interesting idea that you, you might develop really sensitive um, tasks. I think historically, um, from my perspective, um, uh, as, a, as a person trained in neuropsychology, um, it would be about taking a clinical history and always referring back to treating medical team um, for, for the very reasons that we've just heard, which is um, there may be a perception that it's linked to medication, but there are many other factors that might, um, might intervene there or influence that. Um, but if we were able to provide um, some sort of titration, um, I suppose, um, in a kind of uh, rolling sort of way, um, a bit more um, sensitively than we do now, that might offer an awful lot of hope to people where they get that balance between um, seizure control and acceptable cognitive um, concerns. And I think that those word finding difficulties associated with tapiramate can be very distressing for people. And as Arjun mentioned before, the cognitive consequences um, of, of epilepsy uh, can often outweigh the, the actual seizures themselves and the impact of those because they're the distressing day to day. And so anything that we can provide to people in terms of this is what to expect, this is normal, um, it might settle after X period of time, or in fact, actually, if we don't go over this dose, um, then we think that you should be fine and let us know if your memory difficulties get worse than that. So even just setting expectations can really help um, that journey of particularly um, in, in people who are either changing or beginning um, anti-seizure medicines, um, a, a sense of what to expect, which reduces the, the emotional distress, if you hopefully reduces the emotional distress of what is otherwise a very complex period. And I'd say for parents, that's really important as well. You know, every single decision that's happening um, for their child at that time is what impact will that have on education? And that comes through very strongly, um, particularly once seizures are well controlled. So protecting cognition and, and psychological well-being is really key to most people, of course. Of course. And I wonder, you've both been, been speaking about your, your research in this area. Have people affected by epilepsy and living with epilepsy been involved in your work? And, and what value has that brought to this work? Amanda, if you'd like to answer first. Yeah, thanks, Kriva. Um, 
<laughs> it's it's a it's a really important topic. Um, perhaps not this particular work there, but in other work that um, I've been involved with, which has also been very generously funded by Epilepsy Research UK, without the without the co-design of people living with epilepsy, we wouldn't have known the questions to ask or the way in which to ask them well. Um, it's all very well that we have ideas that we generate from our clinical experience, and that is really important, but understanding what matters to people living with epilepsy, particularly that um, horizon scanning. So, we, yeah, we've, we know about this now. What, what would be great to know about next has absolutely transformed not only the specific work that I do, but also the way in which I do research. And um, I, I can think of a number of um, people around the world who will, will laugh if they ever see this, which is, you know, I always say we might not always agree on the way that we do things, but we always agree that we've got a common purpose. Um, so the, the power of advocacy of people with lived experience is absolutely paramount to research. Um, and Epilepsy Research UK has obviously done an awful lot of work in the last year to really um, ask people what's needed in the community. Definitely. And Arjun, the same question to you. Uh, I'm not sure I can put it much better than that. Yeah. But the, um, so yes, I think that um, having true um, community engagement, patient public engagement is going to be key. It leads to better research and it definitely leads to better implementation of the research. Mm -hmm. So for example, if we're developing a, a task for cognition, just doing it in a rather sterile environment of a cognitive lab isn't going to translate how it could be done in clinic by someone who is taking anti-seizure medications, for example. So you need all of that input early. We're very lucky here that we have many, many people who have contributed to a wide variety of epilepsy related projects. And in the trial, for example, so that wasn't, there's an exclusion criteria for the, the study of looking at levotrastam in Alzheimer's diseases, whether you have seizures. But there, what we did is we went to an expert panel or interested panel of people with Alzheimer's disease and very importantly to carers of people with Alzheimer's disease. And that again reflects that bi-directionality of how we should always involve carers of people with epilepsy, families of people with epilepsy as well, because it really did shape the whole trial, you know, the whole lot of how we did it, how it was going to work, um, when, when, which questionnaires were appropriate and so on and so forth. And so I think, yes, that input is invaluable. It's been underappreciated for many years. I think Epilepsy Research UK now is leading the vanguard of having true community engagement um, and lots of other uh, charities and other organizations are really taking that on board and really driving it forward and it is going to lead to better science. Without doubt, thank you so much Arjun and Amanda and if anyone watching is interested in uh, getting involved in research we'll be sharing the details for our SHAPE Epilepsy Research Network in, in the chat. That's so inspiring to hear how people have been involved in, in your research. We've just got time for, for one final quick question. And this question we ask all of our webinar participants, and that's what are your hopes for future research into epilepsy? So Amanda, if we go to you first. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, it, it's such an important question. Um, I think uh, my experience of trying to get funding for research over the years that we felt, particularly in co-design with people with epilepsy, is important but might not have been um, amenable to major funders at the time is really that we have parity of funding. Epilepsy is a very prevalent condition um, and it doesn't receive um, the funding uh, of other conditions and Epilepsy Research UK has done an enormous lot to really leverage people like ourselves um, towards those other grants. So parity of funding is really important. I know that's not quite the question that you ask, but it is critical um, if we're to advance our ideas and our science and our clinical practice. And I think that that's what I'm hoping for is that um, Arjun mentioned it before, you know, team science and collaborating internationally um, to gain data and information really quickly is going to be the best way to rapidly translate from the bench to bedside to the clinic and back again. And so that sort of rapid fire translation is absolutely vital so that we can perform the research that people want and need and we can get it into clinic efficiently and quickly. Definitely. And Arjun, what, what are your hopes for future research into epilepsy? 
Um, well, I, I will, firstly, I'll agree exactly with what Amanda said about the lack of parity, because epilepsy is a very prevalent condition. It's very prevalent globally. It affects people across lifespan. It has huge socioeconomic impact, yet it is still massively underfunded compared to other conditions that are relatively niche, for example. And I think in terms of and then in terms of future hopes, and perhaps specifically related to what we're talking about today, is I hope that there is more uh, transparent working with people from other disciplines across sort of mind and brain health, which is a phrase that we're using a lot here now. Um, so to try and ensure that there is good involvement from psychiatrists, cognitive neurologists, neuropsychologists, as well as everyone else who can look to improve memory. And I think that we're at a critical time for epilepsy or a very good time for epilepsy because there is a real impetus, for example, with epilepsy being highlighted in the World Health Organization intersectoral plan, really trying to drive collaborative research at global scale. And all of these things that we're mentioning today, you know, um, and Kriva knows this, we do a lot of work in global health and global epilepsy. So epilepsy is very overrepresented in um, underprivileged settings, but relatively simple things might make a very, very big difference. So hopefully we can try and translate some of the research globally and try and improve the care for all people with epilepsy. That's so, yeah, the, the eye gap, it just, the eye gap and all of the work that's happening elsewhere with involvement that you've both mentioned, it does feel like we're at a, a tipping point for, for epilepsy and research into epilepsy. And so a really positive note to, to end the webinar on. Thank you so much, Amanda and Arjun, for, for joining us today to speak about, about your research. And thank you to Faustine, who, who joined us earlier in the week. Um, if any of you watching are interested in hearing more from our speakers today, they have all contributed to our research blog, and we'll be sharing the link to that in the chat below. We also have another blog this month from Dr. Francis Wiseman at UCL. Um, about untangling the relationship between Down syndrome, dementia and seizures. Um, and that was published on World Down Syndrome Day. And so if you're watching and you're feeling inspired by any of the research you've heard about today, the iconic Ride London bike ride returns this year on Sunday, the 29th of May, the last day of National Epilepsy Week. You can make a really big difference and ride for research with FLFC Research UK. We have guaranteed places available, meaning you'll be one of the first to take on the brand new route, which starts in Essex and finishes off in London while supporting vital research. And so for more information, please see the link in chat. So a huge thank you again to our speakers today, to all of you for watching, to James and Becca behind the scenes for ensuring that the webinar has gone smoothly. And we really look forward to welcoming you to our next webinar.